الحمد لله نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن باله الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Just a little remark about Imam Zaid's talk, which is a very important talk. I can honestly say that Imam Zaid is among a privileged few that actually practice what they preach. So he does ride a bike all over Berkeley. And he eats local food also. So he's telling you something that he himself does, therefore indicating that it's possible for the rest of us to do it. It's just a matter of will. I want to just, the, the faces of those young people with so much light. You don't see young people with faces like that in the dominant culture anymore. You see young people with purple hair and uh, bones coming out of their nose and their ears. And you also uh, just don't see young people that have a sense of piety anymore, which is quite tragic. And I would just remind all of those young people, Imam Malik when Imam Shafi'i came into his, he was only 15 years old, and Imam Malik saw a light in his face. The Arabs call it Ma al Waj. And, and he said, you, God has given you a light in your face, don't extinguish that light with sinfulness. And so one of the great blessings of youth is that the sins are, are very few. And as you get older, you can either attempt to maintain that as best you can and do toba, or you fall into sinfulness and lose that light. And this is why there's nothing uglier than an old kafir. I, I want to just say something about how people experience this. And one of the things that has been a, a great concern of mine in the last several years is the image of our faith and restoring the dignity of our religion in the eyes of others. Because for many, many centuries, people looked at the Muslim world with great awe. And unfortunately, now they look at the Muslim world quite differently. But what they see here when they come here, people outside of our faith, they see something really remarkable and it has a big effect on them. If you remember several years ago, we brought uh, a, a rabbi here and it was the first time he'd really ever been with Muslims and he was so overwhelmed by it and he still talks about it. But we had one of the visitors who's done really amazing work and I just want to read you what he sent. Uh, to the RIS team. He said, as I sit at the airport here in Toronto awaiting my flight, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you and your team for such an outstanding experience at the RIS. I had dinner with Juan Cole last night and both of us were raving at how well organized and executed the entire convention is. I've attended plenty of conferences and conventions and this one will stand out as one of the best experiences I've had at such an event. First class all the way. And then he said, please pass along my gratitude to all of the RIS volunteers who made this weekend such an extraordinary experience for me. And please know if I can ever be of any assistance to you in the work you are doing with the RIS and beyond for Muslims, I'm at your service. That's a testimony to the impact that interacting with others has. Each one of us, whether we realize it or not, is an ambassador of Islam and more importantly, an ambassador of our Lord, the Lord of Islam. And when you meet people, we've seen and I think Dalia Mujahid and others have shown very clearly that 
people who have interactions with Muslims have a completely different experience of Islam and their attitudes towards Islam. There are many people in, in the West who, who think they've never met a Muslim because they've met Mo or they've met somebody uh, who maybe has changed their name or uses another name. But a lot of people here don't realize that they're interacting with Muslims all the time. So it's very important that we become aware of that and recognize that we are representing them. Our Prophet ﷺ said in an extraordinary hadith which indicates what he desired for our ummah, for our community. He said, أَصْلِحُوا رِحَالَكُمْ وَأَحْسِنُوا لِبَاسَكُمْ حَتَّى تَكُونُوا كَشَامَةِ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ Adorn your houses. Rihal here means you can have rahila, but rihal, one of the meanings is houses or your, where you live, your habitations. He said, adorn your habitations, rectify them. In another riwayah, he said, nadifu afniyatukum. Clean your yards, have clean yards. Because the Muslims are people of cleanliness. They're people of tahara. And so he said, aslihu rihalakum. Rectify your homes وَأَحْسِنُوا لِبَاسُكُمْ And adorn your clothes, wear beautiful clothes so that you, until you are a beauty mark, as if you are a beauty mark amongst humanity. This was what our Prophet ﷺ wanted for the Muslims, for them to be like a beauty mark amongst humanity, something that people saw as beautiful. Allah is in Allah jamilun. يُحِبُّ الْجَمَالِ Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. And this is why the Muslims historically were so committed to Ihsan. They were committed to Ihsan in everything. If you see their calligraphy today, it's sold at Sotheby's. It's sold at Sotheby's, just their writing. They were obsessed with beauty in everything. The mosques are museums. The plates that they ate on are in museums. This was our Muslim Ummah. This is who the Muslims were. تِلْكَ أَثَارُ تَدُلُّ عَلَيْنَا فَانْظُرُوا بَعْدَنَا إِلَى الْأَثَارِ These remnants we leave behind indicate who we were. So look at our remnants after we're gone. You can see who the Muslim community was. But now we have pockets of this. We still have master calligraphers in places like Turkey that still do extraordinary work. We still have people that in, in Morocco, you can still go and see handmade clothes with these extraordinary tailors that are so much better than mass manufactured clothes. The carpets that the Muslims make are the treasured carpets of the wealthiest people in the world. They, they don't buy them from Belgium, machine made carpets. They want carpets made by Muslims in Persia, but in Muslims in, in India and Pakistan and places like that. This is who the Muslims are. We're people of beauty. What, what better religion is the one who surrenders his entire being to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is a person of ihsan. Ihsan is to make things beautiful. Our Prophet ﷺ spoke in the most eloquent way. He was committed to beautiful language. He loved beautiful language. He used to ask them to recite poetry for him at times. And he would ask for more. Ibn Abi Salt was his favorite poet because Ibn Abi Salt was a poet of ethics and speaking of realities and truths. And he would ask them. When he heard one of the great uh, female poets of Arabia, Al Khansa, recite a poem about one of her brothers who was killed, Sakhar, the Prophet began to weep. I was so happy when I read that because when I read the Diwan of Al Khansa, I wept on more than one occasion. And I was happy that I wept at something that made the Prophet weep, which was beauty in language. This is something that our Prophet ﷺ, he loved beauty. He loved beauty and he was the most beautiful human being and he recognized beauty. 
He said, Al tamisu dua in the and the mahasini wujuhikum. Ask for dua, seek dua in beautiful faces. And he wasn't talking about physical beauty. He was talking about the beauty of faith that shines through the faces of beautiful people. Because there are many people that should be beautiful based on their faces, and they're actually ugly based on their actions. And there are other people that should be ugly based on their faces, but they're actually beautiful because of their actions. This is something that we can see in human beings. And so, it's very important that we restore beauty. What we do should be beautiful. Our mosque should be beautiful. We should dress properly. We've lost a sense of, of, of the importance of what a caliph is. And Imam al juwaini said that dress follows urf. Dress follows urf. It follows the custom of a people. In fact, Imam al mawardi in his book, Adab al-Din wa Dunya, one of the great Shafi'i scholars, says that to go against the custom of a people in their dress is stupidity and foolishness. And one of the miracles of our Ummah is wherever the Muslims went, they dress like the indigenous people. And this is why you do not find any standardized dress of Muslims. Wherever they went, they dress like the people because they were telling them, we're like you, we're from you, we're part of you. And this is why when you go to Indonesia, the Muslims dress in their way. If you go to Nigeria, they dress in their way. If you go to Tunisia, they dress in their way. Libya, every group has a distinct way of dressing. This is because the Muslims did not want standardization. They recognize beauty and diversity. Because their Lord, our Lord is the Lord of diversity. Our Lord is the Lord of the rose and the tulip, the orchid. And the petunia, this is our Lord. He's a Lord of diversity. He's the creator of complexions. He's the maker of majestic mountains, some white and some brown and some black and some like rainbows that you find in China and other places. This is our Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, sustainer of all things living. Each one of us right now in this room, in this auditorium, our bodies are doing extraordinary things because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created an incredible body, the human form. He created us in the best of forms. Fi ahsani taqweem. This is who we are. We are the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to behave like a, a caliph. This is why the Egyptian peasant with his galabiya and his sadriya looked like a king. This is why the Afghani with the incredible embroidery looked like a king because they, they recognized who they were. This is the, the native peoples and aboriginal peoples understood this also. And modern people who dress, wealthy people that wear rags, they buy clothes that have holes in them. This is the madness of the time we're living in. We've lost a sense of who we are as human beings. There's a spiritual Alzheimer's that's happening right now. A spiritual Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's means you forget who you are. You lose your identity. You don't know who you are anymore. You are Benu Adam. You're the children of Adam. Wear your adornments at every place of worship. This is who we are. This is why Muslims, our women still dress so beautifully. Sometimes it's so strange to see, I see a, a, a Muslim woman wearing a, 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 a hijab and her scarf. And then you see next to her, her husband wearing a t-shirt and jeans. And it's so incongruous. We need to restore a sense of who we are. We should be a beauty mark amongst humanity. These are important things. They're not, people can think that they're insignificant things, but they're not. They're deep and profound things. And this is why the Muslims were so committed to them for centuries. The Prophet Sallallahu it's a weak hadith, but its meaning has, has real import. He said in a, in a hadith by Imam Al-Bayhaqi and others, he said, Al-Ama'imu tijanul Arab, fa'idha wada'uha wada'ahum Allah. The, the, the turbans are the crowns of Arabs. They're the crowns of Arabs. Wherever the Arabs went, they, they wore a, a turban. And, and he said they're the crowns of Arabs. When they put them down, when they stop wearing them, 
they will be put down in the earth. There's a relationship to understanding who you are and, and what happens to you in the world. If we look at the Muslim Ummah right now, we have never been in a more difficult situation uh, in our history. And I'll tell you the reason why I believe this is so. Because for the first time, we have atheism spreading in the Muslim world. And if you don't believe this, you're not aware of what's happening. This is a problem happening in many Muslim countries. This is the first time in, the, in Muslim history where calamities have resulted in atheism. And the reason for that is that our Ummah for too long has been living off the spiritual capital of the people of the past. We have been living off the spiritual capital of the greats of our past. And, and people are now becoming spiritually bankrupt because they don't do the things that will nurture their soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ No calamity will become or befall. No calamity will befall except by it's the permission of Allah. It's by the permission of Allah. وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبًا And whoever believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will guide their heart. In the commentaries it says, when the calamities fall, they will find a stillness in their hearts. The calamities will not disrupt them because of their belief in Allah. Faith. This is what we need to survive this time. And if you're not doing the work on your spiritual hearts, then when the calamities befall, we will fall into disarray spiritually. And this is the worst thing that can happen. We have Muslims right now fighting over rubble, other Muslims killing each other over stones killing each other over broken homes. We have 11 million refugees in Syria. We have a crisis in Yemen that is unprecedented. Two places that Allah said, Allahumma barak fi Yamanina wa shamina. The Prophet وسلم, said, إِذَا فَسَدَ أَهْلُ الشَّامِ فَلَا خَيْرَ فِيكُمْ If the people of Sham go astray, what good is there in you? The Prophet وسلم, said, الْإِيمَانُ يَمَانِي وَالْحِكْمَةُ يَمَانِيَّةِ Faith is Yemeni. The Yemenites became Muslim. The, the, the Prophet sent people there and they just became Muslim. Even the Persians that were in Yemen became Muslim. This was the reality. Yemen, the, the Prophet loved the Yemeni people. But this is a fitna. When the fitna comes, the intellects go. The Prophet ﷺ warned us, Attaqu fitnatan la tusibanna alladheena dharamu minkum khasa. Guard yourselves against strife that will not just afflict the, the guilty, it afflicts everybody. Children are suffering. We should be against war. This is a time when we have to take seriously the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he spoke about breaking swords. Aerial bombardment, these should be recognized for what they are as crimes against humanity because the people at the bottom of those bombs are, are civilians by and large. They're men, women, and children. They don't deserve to have bombs dropped on them. This is something tragic about our time. We have over a million dead Iraqis. We have over a million dead Afghanis and now close to a million in Syria and 50,000 in Yemen. There are people in this room that have direct relatives and you still have the pain in your hearts of people that you've lost. We have Afghanis in this auditorium right now that have lost immediate relatives. We have Syrians right now that lost their homes. The reality of the time we're living in, there's immense amount of pain, but we have to be people of faith. We have to understand certain things. And one of them is that this world is a tribulation. This world is a tribulation. Imam al Junaid, the great Imam, in the 168th Qaeda of, of Ahmed Zarruq in his book, he quotes Imam al Junaid, who's known as Imam al Ta'ifatan. He was the Imam of the two groups, he was a master of fiqh. He was a master of hadith. He was one of the greatest scholars in the early period, recognized by all of the scholars of his time. And he, he's what he's mujma alayhi. Ibn Taymiyyah recognizes him as one of the great Imams. Imam al Junaid said, Asaltu Aslan. Asaltu Aslan. 
I have taken a foundational principle. لا أتبشع مما ورد علي من العالم. I don't. I'm not disturbed by what comes to me from this world. After I understood this principle, what is the principle? He said, وهو أن الدنيا دار هم وغم وابتلاء وفتنة والعالم كله شر. That this abode of dunya is an abode of grief, of sadness, of trial, of tribulation, of strife and conflict. And that all of the world is wanting. All of the world is wanting. All of the world is wanting. It's lacking. It's a place that Muslims are supposed to fill it with goodness. Because without an ummah that's qa'im and lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no good in this dunya. It's the people of ibadah. And then he said, The nature of this abode is to come to me with everything I dislike. Everything I dislike. And if it comes to me with what I like, then this is from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the two things that we have to be very aware of is sabr and shukr. The Prophet وسلم, in the hadith of Al Qudsi, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi inna mahiya amarukum uhsilakum, thumma wafikum yaha, that, O oh my servants, these are your actions that I will enumerate for you, and then I will recompense. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith Al Qudsi says, فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Whoever finds good, let him thank Allah. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَ But if you find other than that, blame only yourselves. We need to blame ourselves. We have to stop blaming others for our condition. This is the sunnah of our Prophet. If you look at the dua that we just heard about Ta'if, if you look at this dua, what did he complain to Allah? He didn't complain about the people of Ta'if. There's no complaint about the people of Ta'if. They were just doing what they were meant to do. He complained about himself. He said, Allahumma ashku du'fa quwwati wa qillata hilati wa hawani ala nas. He didn't complain about ihanatuhum iyaya. He said, my hawan, my lowliness in the eyes of the people. That was his complaint. And then he said, as long as you're not disturbed with me as long as you're not upset with me I'm content with what you've sent to me because this is a bala from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it doesn't negate the zulm of the people we're not uh, qadariya it doesn't negate the zulm of the people and we condemn the oppression of the oppressors it doesn't negate that but the empowering position of the Quran is always to go to ourselves. And when you were afflicted with a calamity that you had afflicted the twice thereof, you said, why did this happen to us? We're the people of truth. Why is this happening to us? Say it's from your own selves. The Prophet said, Inna, inna, inna ummati, ummatu marhuma. My ummah has the mercy of God on it. My ummah has the mercy of God on it. He said, dunyaha. The punishment of my ummah will be in the dunya. Let them be forewarned. The Prophet ﷺ was told to forewarn us in the Qur'an, let them be forewarned that those who disobey the Messenger of Allah will be afflicted with civil strife. They'll be afflicted with civil strife. They'll be afflicted with painful chastisements. This is what, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Moses, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Remind them of the days of Allah. In those days of Allah are signs for every patient one and grateful one because they're patient in tribulation and they're grateful when the tribulation is removed. And this is what Remember the blessings of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. 
إذن جاكم من آل فرعون يصومونكم سوء العذاب when he saved you from Pharaoh remember that blessing don't remember the tribulation remember the blessing of getting out of the tribulation يصومكم سوء العذاب ويذبحون أبناءكم ويستحيون نساءكم وفي ذلكم بلاء in that the, the killing of your, your men and, the, and, the, and the, the, the taking captive of your wives, leaving them alive to take them as captives in bondage. Allah says, that, that is a tribulation. But a tribulation from whom? From your Lord. From your Lord. And immediately after that, Allah says, if you're grateful, I will continue to bless you with gratitude. If you look in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy in the Bible in chapters 4, 6, 8, 10, 28, and 30, you can see Moses, the very thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about in those verses, Moses tells his people that as long as you obey the commandments, you will have the blessings of Allah, of God upon you. But woe unto you if you deviate from these blessings, you will be afflicted in your homes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'athna alikum ibad lana. They came to you, sir, our servants. Who were those servants? Ulu ba'sin shadeed. The Babylonians came. Fajasu khilal diyar. They came into your homes. At that time, the people of Bani Israel, these were the good people. These were the righteous people. But if you're not doing the work in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do it for you with great difficulty because we're here to purify ourselves. If we're not actively engaged in this, we're given grave tribulations. We have to pray for our ummah. Pray for these places in the Muslim world. Pray. We don't want to see Arabia fall into disarray. We don't want to see fighting in the Haramain. We don't want to see weapons in the Haramain, in the sanctuaries. We don't want to see the breakdown. We should be praying for these people and the stability of their governments. We should be praying for these people. We don't pray against our people. In Imam al tahawis Aqidah, it says that we do not imprecate against rulers. This is part of the aqidah that's agreed upon by Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. La nad'u alayhim wa injaru alayna. Even if they're unjust to us, we still ask Allah to rectify them, to turn their hearts, to bring them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is extremely important. Abu Hanifa said the, the most foolish of people are those who make dua against rulers because he said they're making dua against themselves. Ida aslahu aslahna. As you are, so are the people put over you. Abu Bakr al-Tartushi said, I looked at this uh, hadith which has some weakness in it until I found it in the book of Allah. The meaning in the book of Allah. Like that we put some oppressors over other oppressors. If you don't think we're oppressors, you're in big trouble. Our carbon footprint is an oppression. What Imam Zaid was talking about earlier. All of us are filled with sin and we have to make tawbah and humble ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Daniel the prophet, when the Jews were taken into captivity, he put on sackcloth and put ash and begged God to forgive him. This is what we have to do when the Prophet was asked by Abu Bakr, the greatest heart after our Prophet in this ummah according to our tradition, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. The one who believed the Prophet in every situation when others doubted him. Even when he compromised with the pagans in Mecca. And they said, why are you compromising with the pagans? Aren't we on the truth? Abu Bakr was the only one that didn't have any wavering in his heart. He said, Ya Rasulullah, teach me a dua that I can say in my prayer. He said, Qul, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathira. Say, I have oppressed myself greatly. This was the dua that he taught Abu Bakr as Siddiq. He said, Inni la astaghfirullah sab'ina marra. Every day the Prophet of Allah asked forgiveness. If you look at the, if, if you look at the, the Quranic, uh, the Quranic, the, one of the last uh, verses revealed in the Quran. إِذَا جَاءُكُمْ نَصُرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the, the Nasr of Allah comes to you and the Fath, when it comes to you, what do you do? فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ Ask forgiveness when everything's going well, when you get the opening. 
ask forgiveness. We as an ummah have to ask forgiveness. Wallahi zalamna anfusina. Everything we're seeing is from our distance from Allah and His Messenger. We have to have uns with Allah. The whole world has turned against us. But remember this. Ibn Atayla said, when Allah turns people against you, know that He's opening a door to become intimate with Him. There's women in this room that have just been divorced. This is an opening for you to get close to your Lord. There's men who are suffering the death of a spouse or a sickness. These are all doors to get close to Allah. This is what we have to do. We have to ask forgiveness. This is a difficult time. All of us are struggling to understand it. It's a difficult time, but it's our time. And it's a good time because it's our time. And there's no gift greater than the gift of existence and the gift of faith. And Allah has given us both of these. These are great gifts from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. There are people that are turning away from their Lord. What has deluded you about your generous Lord? Our Lord is a generous Lord. He's a generous Lord. Our Lord is a beautiful Lord. He's a Lord of mercy. He's a Lord of Rahmah. He's our Rahman. He's our Rahim. This is how he built his book by giving us those two names. Bismillah, our Rahman, our Rahim. He sent a prophet. Ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. We have to spread this mercy. We have to spread this mercy. People need mercy. We've had enough. People need mercy. They need mercy. We have to spread mercy. We have to be people of mercy. The first hadith that I learned in the chain of the sin, and this is what all muhadithun teach. Ar-Rahimun, yarhamuhum ar-Rahman, irhamu man fil ard, yarhamkum man fil sama. Those who show mercy, the merciful will show mercy to them. Have mercy on those in the earth, all of those. Man fil ard, and the one in the heavens will have mercy on you. We need to put down these guns and violence. This our, our ummah has gone mad. Really, it's gone mad. And there are many reasons for it, and they're very complex, and I understand that. But we have to get back to the truths of this religion. We have to get back. Buni Islam al khams it was built on five things. It wasn't built on anything but these five things. All the other things are extraneous to the religion. The, the shahada, that there's no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that the Prophet sallallahu is his messenger. Establishing prayer, establishing prayer, as paying the zakat, making the hajj, and fasting Ramadan. This is the hadith that Imam Nawawi relates. Buni al-Islam ala khams. It was built on these five things. We need to restore the centrality of these things. One of the, the beautiful traditions that came out of India was a group called Jama'atu Tablighi. This was a group that what they wanted to do was bring simple Muslims back to the religion. And they created this tradition where they had six principles that they wanted to instill in Muslims. The first one was the vastness of the kalima, what the kalima actually means and the weight of that kalima. And anyone who says that kalima has the hurma of Allah, has the protection of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you want to know who the worst human beings are? He said, Imam Ahmed relates this hadith. Can I tell you who the worst people are? They're the people that go sowing dissension amongst people. And we have so many of these people. We have so many people online and critics and everybody just attacking everybody else. This is a disease in our community. There's something called constructive criticism, but it's not done the way people are doing it. It's not to say that we don't criticize what needs to be criticized, but we have a tradition, a dinu nasiha. Nasiha is also sincerity. It means advice, but it also means sincerity because real advice comes from a sincere point. If you love your brother who's a Muslim, you want for him what you want for yourself. Our religion teaches us not just to want for the Muslim brother to what you want for yourself, but for all people. This is our religion, to want for everybody what we want for ourselves. We have to get back to love of our Prophet. And in conclusion, we have to get back to the book of Allah, to really practicing this book. But the second thing of the Jama'at Tabligh that I wanted to focus in their six principles was love of Muslims. 
love of Muslims, to love your Muslim brother and sister, to, to really, what does that mean? To really love a Muslim, just to want good for Muslims, wherever they are, whoever they are. We should want good for them. We have so much struggling and suffering right now. There's people in this room that are depressed. There's people in this room that are on Prozac. There are people in this room that are taking anxiolytics. We know this because of the statistics. People are, are suffering and we need to bond together as an ummah. One of the most tragic things that I heard was the, the, the head of the religion editor for one of the top news agencies in the West told me, he said, of all the religious communities I've, I'm telling you the God's honest truth. He said, of all the religious communities that I have covered, the most vicious towards one another is the Muslims. He said, it's just shocking how your leadership just attacks each other. And the question is, why are we doing that? Is it moving us ahead? This is the question to ask. Is it moving us ahead? Are we, is, it, is this moving us ahead? Or is it pulling us back? This is something that we have to ask ourselves as a community why that is. I feel the love in this room. This is, uh, this is one of the beauties of the RIS, is that we can feel the goodness in this room. But this goodness has to spread out to our larger community. We need this goodness to spread out to our larger community. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my, my, the point about blaming, the blamer in the Quran is shaitan. In fact, he invented the blame game. Iblis in the Quran, he actually says to Allah, after he asks him, you know, give me some respites. You know, after, after he chases him out for being arrogant because he wouldn't bow down to black clay. He chases it and then he, he tells him, get out. And he says, give me some respite. He says, mundarin. you're from the, the people of respite. And he says, Bima because you led me astray. I will sit in wait on your straight path. And I will come to them in front of them. And behind them. And unto their right. And to their left. And you will not find the majority of them grateful. And this is the second. We have to be grateful. The Prophet Work, oh, oh, the family of David, work out of gratitude. And few of my servants are constantly grateful. We know now that gratitude will literally uplift your spirits. It will, it will change your physiology. We know that people in a state of gratitude live longer. We know that people in a state of gratitude suffer depression much less. They had a study in Davis University, a gratitude study, where they had people that were depressed just write every morning 10 things they were grateful for. And they found over a period of three or four months, they were, they were becoming less and less depressed. Grateful. We need gratitude. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Ajiban li amr al mu'min. This is in Sahih Muslim. How wondrous is the state of the believer. All of his affair is good. And then he said, in If goodness, uh, if he gets goodness, he's grateful. And if he gets when asabatu darra'u if he gets, gets good, he's grateful. And if he has difficulty, he's patient. And the believer is the only one that has that. That's why, because a believer sees it all as good. Even what afflicts him, it's good. Because he gets a reward for his patience. So it's important we restore gratitude in our own lives to our children. 
I mean, we have, there's so many incredible young people in this room. You're an inspiration because you're going against the tide. Rebellion today is to be pious. In the old days, it was to be sinful. When everybody's sinful, then you can rebel by being pious. That's the best way to rebel today. <clears throat> in conclusion, our Prophet ﷺ warned us about these days. These are the latter days. We don't know when the end of time is coming. Some of them thought it would be at the end of the 15th century for the Muslim Ummah. Allah knows, we don't know. But it won't be for a while because the atheists win in this world. They lose in the next world, but they win in this world because the end of time doesn't come until there's nobody left to say Allah. And that's in the Hadith. So we, as long as we're saying Allah, there's good in the world. And I'll tell you, this happened to me recently. I, I, I was in the Vatican. I've been part of an ethics committee at the Vatican for the last two years, going every few months. And, and I learned a lot. But one of the things that really struck me this time, I, went, I was in the Vatican and I went. And one of the things about the Vatican, if you go there, you see all these people, they're just, they're walking around like this. And they're, they're looking at like Michelangelo's paintings and... And it really struck me that I didn't see a lot of people doing devotion. It, it was like, and then I went immediately after that to Medina, and I was so amazed. Despite this ummah, we, we have so much ignorance in our ummah, but there's still so much devotion. And it's just amazing. You, think, you get up at 2.30 and you think you're going to find a place in the Roda. It's already full because people got there before you. Every five prayers, you just see these floods of people going. You see people weeping. You see tears flowing down people's ideas. <coughs> you see people doing khatam. It's just, it's stunning. <coughs> Excuse me, to see the devotion in our ummah. Our ummah is still alive. It still has a heart. And, and we're still the people of Allah, inshallah. May Allah continue to bless this ummah with and restore our knowledge, restore sanity to our leaders, wherever they are and whomever they are. The Prophet ﷺ said to Imam Ali when he asked him, the Prophet said that, Yati al nas zaman, he said the time will come when it's, there'll be fitan ka qata al al muslim. There'll be fitan like a portion of a dark black night. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ, he asked him, مَا الْخَلَاصُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ How do we get out on that day? And the Prophet ﷺ said, كِتَابُ اللَّهِ فِيهِ نَبُؤُ مَا قَبْرُكُمْ وَخَبْرُ مَا بَعْدُكُمْ وَلَحُكْمُ مَا بَيْنَكُمْ هُوَ الْفَصَلْ لَيْسَ بَالْهَزَلْ مَنْ تَرَكُهُ مِنْ جَبَّارٍ قَصَّمُهُ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ ابْتَغَ الْهُدَى فِي غَيْرِهِ أَضَلُّهُ الله هو حبر الله المتين ونوره المبين وهو ذكر الحكيم وهو السراط المستقيم وهو الذي لا تزيغ به الأهواء ولا تلتبس به الألسنة ولا تتشعب معه الأراء ولا تشبع منه العلماء ولا تمله الأتقياء ولا تنقض عجائبه وهو الذي لم تنتهي الجن إذ سمعته أن قالوا إنا سمعنا قرانا عجبا إنا سمعنا قرانا عجبا من دعا من حكم من قال به صدق ومن حكم به عدل ومن دع ومن عمل به أجر ومن دع إليه هدى أو هدية إلى صراط مستقيم هو عصمة لمن تمسك به ونجاة لمن اتبعه. This is an extraordinary hadith that Imam Tirmidhi relates. At the end of time, he said, cling to the book of Allah. We were told not to be sectarian. This is a commandment from Allah. It is haram to fall into sectarianism. This is a commandment from Allah. And call people to unity. Call people to unity. Really. The Shia and Sunnah should not be fighting. We both say La ilaha illallah. This is the hurma of the kalima. We shouldn't be fighting. The Amman Declaration, which I signed, the Amman Declaration identifies eight of these different groups that all of them, inshallah, have salvation and, and we shouldn't be fighting. So this is important to call people back to the Book of Allah. It has news of what went before. It has news of what's coming. It's something, it's a criterion. It's not a light, 
it's heavy. سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا. It's not heavy. It's the hubble of Allah. It's the rope of Allah to cling to. It's the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's his light. جاكم من الله نور. This is a light that's come from God. It's a light. It's the straight path. It's the wise reminder. It's the one that people will not go astray in their appetites with it. Their tongues will not become diverse with it. Their, their, uh, their opinions will not become ambiguous with it. This is the book that its wonders will never cease. This is the book that when the jinn heard it, they said, we heard a wondrous book. This is the book that the one who call, the one who speaks by it has spoken the truth. The one who calls to it is rightly guided. The one who acts according to it is rewarded. And the one that clings to it will have salvation. Arikum bi kitab Allah. The his will take you 15 minutes maximum. Do a hizb in the morning and a hizb in the evening. Many of you read a newspaper for 15 minutes. Read the, t the eternities, don't read the times. Read the eternities, don't read the times. People spend, now if you have the latest iPhone, it tells you how much time you're wasting on the iPhone. Look at that and then ask yourselves, do you have 15 minutes for the book of Allah in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our ummah. May he restore the sanity of this ummah. May he bless every single person in this room. Anyone who's depressed, may Allah uplift your heart. May he put joy in your heart. Anyone who's going through a divorce, may Allah make that transition easy to a better thing. Um Habib, when she came from, uh, from Habasha, the Prophet ﷺ, she had just, her husband had left Islam, but she held strong. And when she came from Habasha, the Prophet ﷺ said to her, may Allah, may, may Allah give you a good husband. She, she ended up becoming married to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, another one of his wives, his husband died, who was a righteous man. And the Prophet made a dua, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace him. And, and she said, who could be better than him? And then the Prophet married her. So, Good will come, inshallah. Maybe you hate a thing, but in it is good for you. Allah knows and you don't know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all these extraordinary, beautiful young people. May He preserve the light in their faces. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the volunteers. May Allah bless all the people that supported this, all the people who came from wherever you came. Look at all of the organization on this planet for dunya. Humans are so organized for dunya. It's amazing. We work together for dunya. Just to get all of you here from your different places, miracles were performed of organization. Allah says, ta'awnu ala al-birri wa taqwa la ta'awnu ala al-ithmi wa al-unwan. May He make us people of working together for goodness and for righteousness and not for sinfulness and aggression. Aqudu qawri hadhu wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa risayinu muslimin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.